So our third presenter is Josh De La Rosa from a company called ABT SRAI. Or Josh. of utilizing consumer-grade GPS receivers within the transportation research application. and our presentation today is the implications of using consumer grade GPS uh, devices in the transportation setting. Uh, so some of the research questions we had is uh, how, do, how do consumer grade GPS loggers compare to GIS grade uh, loggers? I come from the survey research background so sometimes when you test a survey question when you don't know how people will respond you take a the true value and you compare it to what people are saying in the survey question and then that will help you understand the error rates. So if you're asking a question about health records, you have the true deck about the health records and you ask people a question about the health records and that produces the error rates. So it's applying about that same methodology to uh, consumer grade GPS loggers. What are some sources here in New York City of error when it comes to uh, GPS data collection and what should researchers consider when using GPS data? So here's a quick overview, uh, a brief introduction to uh, GPS usage in, the in travel surveys, how a GPS technology works, which is uh, on the surface, we have we kind of have a good understanding how it works, but when you dig a little bit deeper about the limitations and the sources of error, that's something that's going to impact how we use GPS data in transportation research. Our testing methodology, some of the results, and some things to consider when using GPS data in our surveys or in our studies. So uh, how GPS uh, usage is used in travel surveys. Uh, surveys collect demographic information, attitudes, and opinions. There isn't a sensor yet that it can tell you how people feel or their modes for transportation. So that's why we use uh, we still use surveys to people for the report uh, some of this information. But GPS data provides some rich amount of uh, high resolution data, so spatial and temporal data. If you think about it, you can ask in a survey how fast you were driving or what route you took. But sometimes the GPS uh, receiver is a better source of that kind of data. Uh, it also provides acceleration and speed, which is again something that you typically wouldn't be able to accurately collect from a respondent. Uh, route path information, and it's also used for underreported trips. So uh, typically when we see in travel diaries, people may say, I went to home to work, but they may not report that trip to Dunkin' Donuts. And now GPS uh, is a good source of uh, collecting those underreported trips that people may not want to report or forget to report. So the GPS technology, a quick overview. It's about 31 satellites. And this is changing, but it's about 31 satellites. How GPS determines uh, uh, location is you, uh, they figure out distance. Uh, with, and distance is rate times, uh, rate multiplied by time. Rate is a known variable, and rate is the speed of light, which is the radio signal from the GPS satellite to your receiver. And time is the timestamp from the GPS receive, the GPS satellite to the GPS receiver, uh, the difference in the timestamp, and that's how we get distance. When you take four of those measures, you'll be able to triangulate, and that's how we get an estimate as to GPS, as uh, location from GPS satellites. The government reports that the accuracy rate at 95% is about 7.58 meters. There's a discussion about, well, what's the difference between the civil use of GPS and defense use of GPS? They have more signals, but it's, a, it's about the same. Seven point, when it comes to civil usage, it's 7.8 meters at 95% confidence. Here are some sources of GPS error, and as you can see, some of these are not going to be able to control in the travel study. So signal distortion, and some of these are going to come from environmental effects. You, you really can't change your environment where your respondents are working in. Uh, residual re uh, receiver delay errors, receiver noise, so that the, the actual device itself producing noise. Uh, hardware or software faults, well, within each GPS receiver, there's an algorithm processing the data, and there may be faults in there. Multipath error, which is commonly known as urban canyoning. Uh, user antenna, so how strong the signal is coming in, and operator <coughs> error. So if we think about it, uh, GPS device, people are going to put in their pockets, they're going to put it in their uh, glove compartments, and that's also going to cause some error. So a quick overview about GPS devices. Uh, there's loggers, and the loggers collect data, and they download the data offline. 
there's transmitters, and these uh, transmitters collect data and submit the data real time, so they have a, uh, a wireless or a 3G connection that's submitting data to a server. And smartphone applications, these smartphone applications are taking data from the smartphone. Uh, they're also using assisted uh, methods using a Wi-Fi or cell phone, tunnel, uh, cell phone tower to correct the data, and they're sending that data real time or logging it into, into the phone and, and batch uploading. Think about the cost, about a consumer grade logger. The consumer grade logger, uh, like the one shown there, it's about $60, not terribly expensive. Uh, when you're doing uh, large scale surveys and you're having thousands of respondents, you really can't afford to have the GIS grade solution sent to respondents, so they have to be uh, cost sensitive. And if you talk to manufacturers about GPS uh, <laughs> loggers and receivers, there's different configurations, but the chipsets are basically the same. There aren't too many manufacturers of chipsets. Uh, so here I have a Surf, which was uh, purchased by Qualcomm, Ublox, and MTK. Uh, there's others, but the boxes may look the same, but most of the chipsets are the same across the GPS devices. So our testing methodology, we, we use a GIS grade uh, uh, receiver, and that's shown here, the, the Treble uh, Geo7X. And we also have the external antenna. So that antenna was mounted on top of a car using a magnet. It's much bigger than what you would see in a consumer grade of device. Um, this setup itself is more than $10,000. So again, this is not the kind of setup you would give to a server respondent. And then when the data was processed at the office, we used differential correction. As I mentioned, uh, GPS uses receivers from the satellites to the, log, to the device. But with differential correction, their base stations maintained by the, uh, the Department of Transportation and uh, they're another source of information to correct the data uh, back in the office. So here's the methodology. What we did is took timestamps between the different loggers and matched them, because uh, all the loggers were at the same location. We ran a route from Astoria down to uh, Lower Manhattan and back a, a few times, so that we have about 10 hours of data collection. Uh, we have four consumer grade GPS loggers, including a cell phone that had uh, assisted GPS, and each logger stuck the data at one second intervals. One thing you'll notice already, sure if you can see my mouse. There's points here that we don't have data. The, GP, the consumer grade logger is gonna give you GPS data no matter what. It's just gonna keep on spinning that GPS data. And sometimes it's just an estimate. I'll get to that a little bit more. But with the Tremble GPS system, uh, what we did is we filter out uh, points that we couldn't get accurately at five meters at 95% intervals, I mean 95% confidence, which means here at the 59th Street Bridge, we don't have data. Uh, long here, Broadway and the Upper West Side, we don't have data. And that's where the, the, the Tremble device said, I don't really, I can't accurately tell you where we are. So that's something to consider that even with the high grade GPS uh, devices, uh, with a high confidence, the device could not tell us where we were. And this is after post correction. So with that said, when we compare the GPS devices, the consumer grade GPS devices to the Tremble devices, you'll see that the medium, oh, sorry, myself. The medium error rate was uh, about 10, com uh, uh, 10 meters. Uh, the mode uh, with the medium was 10 meters and the mean was about 16. This is where we take, took all the points across the different loggers. And again, uh, you see that the skew is uh, to the left. So it's, uh, you know, you, you see some 51 meter errors, uh, some three meter errors, but it's around uh, the 10 meter error rate. But this is a bit biased again because the Tremble device did not pick up uh, cell phone, uh, did not pick up GPS reception across the city. So there's points that the Tremble device uh, couldn't get symbol, so we couldn't compare it, so we didn't really know what the truth was. So uh, my assumption is gonna be that error rate's actually a bit higher. So what does 10 meters mean? Uh, there is a correlation we found between building height and error rate. So this is a, a, a map and the, the color and density uh, shows the median building height. So what we found is when we compare the median building height for, to a census block to the error rate, there was a positive correlation, which is basically what we know already about multipath error in urban canyoning, that there is an error rate. Uh, what we also find is the error rate is not the same across all the, the loggers. Well, we had, we had loggers that with the same chipset in the same location at the same time, the error rate was different. So there is variance across the different loggers. So it's not um, something that we would say more of a bias, that everyone biases one way or the other. It's sometimes it's, it's a bit random. Um, and as I said, the error rate included the GPS, uh, the, the GIS grade uh, device. So again, 59th Street Bridge, we weren't able to get a reliable estimate, but as we the path error and, the, and the, the, the iron and the steel with the bridges, we're not gonna get good uh, reception there. Again, this is just a different representation, representation of our route. We took our route down Broadway and around 
uh, Lower Manhattan, and as you can see, uh, Urban Canyon is a problem here. And if you have a respondent that's doing your survey, there's not much you can do about the Urban and Canyon part because that's it's just an environmental effect. When we took the GPS devices and we mapped them back to a census block, what we found in the purple is that the purple put the GPS device in a census block that wasn't true. Uh, so if we're thinking about uh, we're collecting data as to how many people enter a census block or what is the actual location of the, of the person uh, down to a census block, you see that there's some parts there that it, it produces error. So this is another way I'm looking at it. So just looking at the 10 meter error that could put you in a different census block. This is research that we're working on is building on other research. So Daniel Sheehan at, at the University of Columbia, uh, his staff looked at this research from the health perspective and what they found is the GPS error rate uh, when you're processing the data could lead to problems with mode uh, inference. So uh, what they found is here on the left, this is an area with uh, high building heights. And here on the, uh, uh, here on the, actually the right is the high, uh, high building right heights. Excuse me, and the left is lower building heights. And what they found is they started to process the data they knew what the truth was, and they started to get different speeds from people traveling based on uh, where they were, which, which produces error, and they were looking at health rates. Uh, he also did research, if you're familiar with the research on uh, the TLC data on the GPS, uh, the G T uh, TLC GPS data, and what they found is when they uh, mapped the GPS data to road beds, obviously they had uh, taxis flowing down the East River. So, uh, so there was uh, error rates there uh, that it's difficult to control for. So some of the implications, uh, the higher the level of geography you're looking at, the more, the higher the error rates. So uh, if you think about, if it's 10 meters about accuracy, you're gonna be obviously in the right country, in the right state, right county, likely the right track. But when you get down to block, group, and block, that's when you start seeing higher rates. And when you get to rooftops and points, the error rate increases. Uh, it's gonna have impacts when you're matching GPS data to surveys because the GPS point is going to put you in a different place while the self-report uh, geocoded address may put you in a different place and that data may look unmatched but it could be the error from the GPS that leads to that unmatching. The error is not random. Uh, different, uh, well, the error is not random when it comes to environmental effects. Building height does have an impact. Uh, environment, uh, the weather does have an impact. So those are things that are just uh, things to consider. And the more devices, the more error you're going to see. More difference between the, the devices. So on the right hand side, we have a map of the fragmentation of different Android devices. Each Android device may have a different GPS chipset and that may produce a different type of error. So that's something to consider. It's a bit harder to control for the different error that comes from the actual hardware device. Uh, and the implication of that again is uh, when the error is produced, it, it could have problems when you're trying to infer mode of travel and the distance because the, the GPS signal is <coughs> correct. Conclusions. Uh, latitude and longitude, lat latitude and longitude is an estimate. So when you're thinking about it as an estimate, just like any statistical estimate, you would, when you're dealing with the data, you would want to collect measures of uncertainty or unclarity. Uh, it's going to give you an exact point, but you want to think about what is the level of confidence with that point, and what is the level of error associated with that point. Is it five meters? Is it two meters? We saw points that were 120 meters away from the actual point. So that's something to consider that it's an estimate and you want to take that into consideration when analyzing data. Other metadata that's going to help you understand the level of certainty is the number of satellites. As the previous presenter said, uh, the more satellites, the better. Uh, so that's something that's going to or should feed into your analysis of the quality of the GPS data. How many satellites were used to determine the actual point? Accelerometer data. Uh, what we found is even when you're not moving, the GPS signal shows you jumping around. So something to control for that is to think about uh, the accelerometer data as, a, as a, another point to say, does the distance travel match with the accelerometer data that's uh, produced? And again, the level of confidence, how much, how much confidence is in that estimate? Uh, I mentioned GPS and uh, differential correction, but what smartphones are starting to use and what we saw Waze is starting to use is using uh, beacons uh, with Bluetooth that have a known location and that the information is uh, corrected against. So that's another solution, but the issue of Bluetooth is that it's application specific, so your application needs to be able to uh, find that Bluetooth and know what that, this, that location means. So I'm running out of time, so that's my information. Uh, if you have any questions or need references, I'll be happy to uh, help. Any questions? Yes.
just curious about uh, what was the initial reason for doing this study? Well, uh, when we're working with GPS data, sometimes uh, we'll, we'll get uh, feedback from respondents or clients that say, uh, the device is putting me somewhere else I'm not supposed to be. It says I'm in a different building, and that's cor uh, correcting, uh, causing error uh, with my estimates. Uh, and the question is, um, what are the sources of those errors, and is that something controllable? Is that something that uh, is a hardware solution, or is it a software solution? And what we found is uh, there's some points that uh, there, it, there's no real hardware solution with urban candy. Uh, so that's something that we're finding. And there is a, there is an error rate, and that's something that should be discussed. Uh, is a point estimate. Uh, so sometimes we have clients that they just ask for uh, lat long for each point, uh, but there are different levels of accuracy for those lat longs. And that's something that should be uh, considered when analyzing that data, just like we would do any point estimate. So if I say income is X, there's a certain level of uncertainty of that income, and that should be reported. And the same is true of GPS data. Thank you. I guess a broader picture is that when you find out uh, the GPS points align with some roads or highways. You can figure out which highway they pick to go to work, come to work, which will be very helpful for transportation planning. So whether, uh, how accurate the GPS uh, points can tell you which route or which highway that the commuter takes gives a lot of indication of how the traffic is going on in the area. Uh, I guess you have presented a lot of details about the accuracy and how it affects uh, uh, how to get a better measurement of the GPS to data to its real location. But when that is figured out, it would be very useful for transportation planning. Yeah, so, so we know yeah, yeah, how so, people go. So one thing we thought about is could, could you sample people using GPS data as to what bridges and tunnels are they crossing? But with the level of error, it's going to sometimes going to be more like inference to figure out if they came across uh, uh, the, mid, the uh, Lincoln Tunnel, uh, because you're not going to get accurate estimates on both ends. You're certainly not going to get accurate estimates within the tunnel. So uh, that's that. That's where it gets to how accurate is it? Is it accurate at the block level, at the track level, um, or if you're doing other type of geofencing sampling, the level of accuracy plays in. Right. There are companies pretty well known for using GPS for travel survey, which was traditionally done on paper. People have to fill out paper questionnaires. Using GPS with accurate GPS data, um, you get the location and the time, and so uh, it will be very helpful, right? So, thank you very much. Our uh, last is uh, the Lufa Garamani from City University of New York, uh, <coughs> presenting on a topic. Uh, title called An Exploratory Analysis of Intercity Travel Patterns Using Back End Data from a Transit Smartphone Application, which is a topic I really like because the previous two presentations are pretty much on vehicles, but we do want to ha see how people commute, right? So the <laughs> smartphone application will tell us that. Hi, my name is Milosar Ahramani, and I did this study with my advisor, uh, Professor Breaker at City College of New York, and Professor Peter at College of Staten Island. We did an exploratory analysis to find intercity travelers uh, based on the data obtained from back and forth and transit smartphone application. Um, in this presentation, we define the research question and um, motivation, the overview of the app we are working with in this study, the data we got from the area of our analysis, we talk about methodology and we, uh, then uh, give an example of two intercity travelers we found based on this methodology and uh, uh, conclusions and future research. And the main research question we are trying to answer here is that if uh, data from backend server of a transit, uh, multi-city transit application can be used to identify and um, study travel pattern of intercity travelers. Uh, what motivated us for this study was that um, intercity travelers and visitors are big source of uh, transit ridership, especially in big metropolitan areas. And um, Current um, methods of collecting data for intercity travelers, such as uh, long, distance, long distance travel surveys, uh, cannot capture all the uh, travel patterns uh, in detail because they are conducted very infrequently.
ultimately, and um, as other presenters said, um, the respondents can be inaccurate in their answers. Uh, so this uh, method we use here is exploratory, and uh, we, it has two steps. In the first step, we try to identify the interstate travelers, and in the next step, we want to see their patterns and uh, classify them further based on the number of days they have uh, used the app inside of the metropolitan area and outside of the metropolitan area for one month in October 2014. Uh, the smartphone application we are uh, working with in this study is Transit App. Transit App is uh, founded in uh, Montreal, Canada in 2012. Uh, now it has a coverage in nine countries and more than 125 cities. It, uh, this app is free for download. It is available on Android and iPhone. And the main functionality of this app is to provide real-time transit information for the users. Uh, anytime a user opens the app, um, her, uh, their location is shown here in this blue dot. Uh, and based on this location, the app shows nearby transit uh, stations and transit vehicles arrival times. Um, so uh, we got the data directly from transit app developers. This data set contains information of the users who has opened the app at least once in October 2014 in New York metropolitan area. Um, anytime a, a user opens the app, their, um, their record instantly saves in the backend server of the app uh, in a CSV file. Um, their report, uh, regardless of uh, what feature of the app they are checking or which route they are looking at. Um, this information uh, includes uh, their coordinates, the time stamp they are opening the app, uh, a unique identification number for their device, which presents the, uh, represents the individual user, and a unique ID for their interaction. If they are checking multiple <coughs> features, they will have multiple uh, ID for the inter interactions. For one month of October 2014, we had over 30 million records in New York metropolitan area, uh, and we had 170,000, more than 170,000 records, uh, um, unique devices uh, that created these records. And for maintaining users' privacy, all the coordinates in this data set were shifted by a random number up to 300 meters by the developers, and we also signed an agreement to not share data with other parties and <coughs> inform them about the research we do and the results we get. Uh, we chose New York City as an um, uh, area of our analysis. <coughs> Uh, many intercity travelers and, uh, and uh, visitors come to New York or uh, travel from New York. And uh, New York has a high number of concentration of transit system, and it is uh, among the highest areas of transit app usage in the United States. Uh, we used uh, Nimtex operating area as a base area, and we defined a bonding box around this area to represent inside of New York metropolitan area and outside of New York metropolitan area. Uh, meaning that each uh, coordinates that is inside this park we consider to be inside New York area. And if it is outside, we consider it to be outside of New York metropolitan area. Uh, in this study, we had two big, uh, major steps. The first step was to identify the intercity travelers. And uh, for this step, we um, divided the records we have in the data file into the records inside of the um, metropolitan area, New York metropolitan area, and outside of New York metropolitan area. And then we found the devices that has um, records both inside of the area and outside of the area. Uh, by this method, we identified 3,778 intercity travelers, and they had 500,000 records uh, inside of the area and 60,000 records outside of the area. In the next step, we further classify them to better understand their pattern and um, to, if we can infer their home location city, we can infer which city they are living in. Uh, and for this part, we counted the number of days each user has opened the app inside and outside of the defined area. 
Um, this map here shows the um, part of um, intercity travelers record that has op uh, happened outside of the New York area and inside of inside United States. We don't show the uh, it doesn't show the international uh, records. Uh, so you can see that um, there are many shorter trips uh, around the bounding cuts we defined and there are uh, a smaller number of uh, longer distance trips that are ha happening other side of the country and um, they have been probably, probably from New York to those cities or from those cities to New York. Um, in the next step, we classified the intercity travelers by counting the number of intercity, uh, we found that uh, 3,700 intercity travelers we found, we count uh, the number of uh, those travelers um, uh, by the number of days they have opened the app inside of New York region and outside of New York region. As you can see here, the x-axis shows the number of days inside of New York area and y-axis shows the number of days outside of New York area, both ranging from 1 to 31 days in October. And the uh, z-axis shows the count of intercity travelers. Um, and we group the users by show them by color here. The color that you see the most is green. Uh, we think these groups are New York residents because they have been inside New York more number of days than they have been outside of New York. They have checked out more number of days inside the area. They have been outside only three days or less, and they have been uh, outside. Uh, they have been outside three days or less, and inside more than three days. Uh, unlike this group are the group that are shown in pink. They are probably visitors to New York because um, they have been outside three days or um, inside of New York three days or less and outside more number of them. So we think they have been pro uh, probably visiting New York. Um, the other group here are uh, infrequent transit app users uh, that are shown in dark um, orange. Um, they have used the app less than three days both inside and outside of the area. So uh, they are, they might be not using transit system at all very much. So we don't have enough information about them to see their travel pattern. And the other group, the last group that you can see here are shown in yellow. There are frequent travelers. We think they are traveling a lot because uh, they have been uh, equal number of days inside and outside of the area we defined. In the next step, we, uh, find, we pick one of these visitors who is probably visiting New York because uh, this user has been outside of New York for four days and inside for one day, and we map the record that this user has with the transit app. This map here shows uh, this user's record. Uh, so based on the visualization, we can see this person was in Miami from October 11th to October 14, 2014, and if uh, he or she was in New York in October 14, and in October 14, we see this person both in, in both cities in airport location. So uh, based on number of days and uh, what we see here, we can infer that this person lives in Miami and was traveling to New York on October 14. But it is also possible this person is living in New York City and traveled to Miami for four days and uses transit up more there to, because um, he or she is unfamiliar with the transit system there. And uh, the other visitor we choose here uh, has been longer time, uh, number of days outside of New York uh, for eight days and inside for three days. Um, this person was in New York for October 2nd, 4th, and 5th, and outside the Dominican Republic for one week, from October 13th to 20th. So uh, this person, we think, lives in Dominican Republic and visited New York for three days, because it, uh, we see in more number of days in Dominican Republic. But um, it's also, like the other user, it is uh, possible that uh, he or she lives in New York and have been traveling to Dominican Republic for one week. So in conclusion, we did an uh, exploratory analysis based on a niche, uh, rich and new data source. And in first step, we were able to identify 
2,700 intercity travelers among all the transit app users, and in the next step, we further classify them to a smaller subgroups, subgroups uh, to understand their travel pattern better. And uh, we found four, four possible groups of intercity travelers, visitors to New York, intercity travelers who travel a lot, infrequent transit app users who are probably infrequent transit system users, and New York residents. Um, all these groups are, um, we think they belong to this group. Um, and uh, this study was first a step, uh, a study toward identifying intercity travelers. And there are many other areas of um, improvement for this study. Uh, if we have longer time frame, at least one year, we can better understand their travel pattern, and we can better uh, infer their home location and their city they are visiting. Uh, we can consider other factors to classify the interstate travelers. We can count the uh, consecutive number of days they have been in a place, not only the uh, number of days they have been in a, an area. Uh, we can study their pattern by day of the week. If they are using the app more in weekends, they are probably traveling for leisure or um, other purposes. But if they are using the app on weekdays mostly, uh, they travel into um, New York for business trips or they are commuting to work and they may be living very um, closely to New York area. And uh, we can also consider travel distance by, to classify them uh, if they have uh, traveled long distances or uh, short distances and uh, it can also give some information about their purpose of their, their trip. Um, and we can validate the data, this data, um, these results with um, other data sources like uh, long distance travel surveys or if any other survey that we can design through this study. And because Transit App is a multi city application, we can ex expand this study to other areas. Thank you. I have a question. Yeah. Um, do, do the app people, do they give you access to what they, the users were asking for? In terms of were they asking for subway directions or bus directions? Um, or? Yes, there are other files in the backend server of this app that shows which routes they have checked and which features if they have using triple and feature of the app. Or, um, yeah, we can study them in more detail in terms of routes and exact destinations. So is it possible then to confirm that those people then actually took the trips? Uh, we don't know if they actually took the trips because uh, they opened the app and they looked for the information, transit information in those locations. So we are not sure. They are physically there and uh, checking and taking the subway or going on that trip. But it's uh, intended trip and um, Mostly because it's GPS data, um, they, uh, we can infer that they took the trip. But we cannot be 100% sure. So the app doesn't actually continue tracking them once the, it's closed? Or um, if they don't close the app probably and it's running on the back, the back end of their uh, smartphone, it keeps sending their location to the server because the GPS is working and the app is open. So it uh, keeps sending their location and we can track them more, uh, but there is not, um, and maybe uh, they are trying to add this feature to um, inform the uh, riders that are on the ride to say that like, um, you are getting to your stop, but it wasn't in the data set we got from October 2014. Thank you. Thank you. We put this section together mainly because the last three presentations showing how we could collect data in cars and uh, personal travel and all those data are pretty much called big data that there are not much cost involved to keep sending the data or collecting the data. Uh, in my research we actually have the data goes from the phone to a cloud server. 
So it's relatively cheap in collecting those data and it will be very helpful and tied to the first presentation, the best of practice model. Basically, it's a model well known for cities doing transportation planning. So um, this is a breakthrough in using technology for transportation and it fits uh, the uh, Transportation Technology Summit. This theme really well. Um, we are very good at uh, uh, time-wise, and I just want to make sure that if you have questions for the other three presenters or the last presenters, you could uh, ask now before we break for the section. Any questions for all four presenters? Uh, yeah, I hear all this, and this may be a naive question, but it strikes me that Lower Manhattan would be a great place to test autonomous cars. And even with the canyons and things like that, it seems like a mix of all these things, all these technologies, um, would somehow be able to map out a three-dimensional map in real time uh, to make that possible, or am I just being extremely naive? Uh, autonomous cars in Midtown. No, no, Manhattan. Lower Manhattan. Lower Manhattan. <laughs> uh, uh, using GPS or using, well, using GPS beacons, your phone, uh, you know, the full, it seems like none of them work totally. Like the GPS, you have the canyon problem, but if you start mixing that with um, uh, beacons, uh, Bluetooth, and, and various end of phones, it seems to me that you might be able to put together a real time map uh, where you could still do autonomous cars. Uh, I'm, I'm not so confident. Uh, how about the second? <laughs> Because I, because I, we tested the GPS logger for the New York Metropolitan Transportation Council uh, in 2007 and 2008 in Manhattan. Uh, the average um, uh, inaccuracy is uh, about 40 meters to 60 meters. So I don't know how this could be used for autonomous vehicle. Uh, of, of course, with the radar and Bluetooth and, and Wi-Fi, when you get more of those, it gets more accurate. But driving, you know, that small difference can, you know, cause an accident or not. But I think um, the second presenter can answer the question better, right? Uh, oh, he's got it now, Scott? Do you think you could answer the question for him? <laughs> I mean, just from my, from what I know, I, I seriously doubt that an autonomous vehicle could be used in lower or midtown Manhattan in the next two or three years because I know that when they do that on those campers um, uh, with a very light traffic, there are still uh, accidents and in New York, I so, seriously so doubt. This. So we've done some evaluation of different data sets available out there, everything from cell phone data to GPS data and so on. And one of the things we found is that each data set obviously has its own issues. Um, for example, there are vendors out there with GPS data who have uh, information uh, which, which uh, uh, is available from origins and destinations. However, many times you find those destinations to be in the middle of a highway. So it just ends. And that's because people are switching off the GPS system or whatever the case may be. So uh, there's that, there's the inaccuracy of um, cell phone data right now because it's available at the aggregate level uh, for privacy issues. They essentially aggregate it all up. Um, so there are issues like that. And so fusing data is certainly a challenge. It's being done right now by various companies and agencies. But it's a challenge because you have different issues with these different data sets. So forming some, developing a 3D uh, a visual of, of data given all these different sources is, is, is a great idea. Uh, but I'm, I'm not sure how feasible it is given some of the inaccuracies. So taxi cab drivers will still have jobs. Right. <laughs> well, I think to your point, something that we're considering is could you model out the level of risk associated with GPS data based on zones? And maybe you say, between cities on an interstate, a GPS is going to be very good. Lower Manhattan may want to postpone our autonomous driving situation because of the level of accuracy there. So that way we don't say that letting perfect be the enemy of good. 
Um, in our first symposium in 2013, we actually had a professor from Columbia University uh, uh, who did a presentation on the autonomous uh, vehicles. Um, I think the video is on the website. So when you receive the email from UTRC, uh, I think the first link is for the first symposium. If you click in, there are uh, some videos of uh, the presentations for the first symposium. So if you want to know more about it, um, uh, watch the video. Uh, I remember uh, clearly he said that he's not going to go on a Google car for a few years <laughs> unless he's more sure about it. So I mean, but that's a, definitely a good direction to go, but I don't think it the data is collected accurately enough to have autonomous vehicle in Manhattan yet. Any other questions? <coughs> All right, so uh, uh, thank you for coming. <coughs>